Hi guys, welcome to CNB. I'm Siddharth Panayak Patankar. Very much in the driver's seat today, as you can see, both literally and metaphorically, because we have got quite the show for you. The car that everybody has been hotly anticipating for some time now is the latest from Mahindra, that is the XUV300. King Shook had the chance to drive the car extensively in Goa, and you've been wanting it. Here is our review. Mahindra's ownership of Sangyong gave us the Rexton turned Arturas a few weeks ago. And now, we are all set for its younger brother. The new XUV300 could prove to be the next big thing in the subcompact SUV segment in India. It is derived from the Sangyong Tivoli and is essentially a shortened version of it. But it packs in a bit more style and many more features. The subcompact SUV space in India grew by a solid 23% last year. With over 4 lakh units sold, it is without a doubt the fastest growing car segment in India today. And now, Mahindra has a brand new model to take on the likes of the Maruti Suzuki Vitara Brezza, the Ford EcoSport and the Tata Nexon. We are in Goa to test drive the all-new Mahindra XUV300. It does seem like an exciting prospect and we can't wait to start driving it and tell you how it is. The design of the new XUV300 is edgy and stylish. We like the way the front end looks. The slim grille is accentuated by the LED projector headlamps and daytime running lamps to give it a sophisticated look. The fog lamps get black housing and are sort of connected to the headlamp by a thin DRL strip. View it in profile and you see the typical crossover stance. The character lines above the wheel arches add muscle to the XUV300 along with the plastic cladding on the lower edges of the car. We would have loved to see 18 inch tyres even as an option, but we'll have to make do with the 17 inches. The rear is characterised by smart looking tail lamps and an integrated spoiler on the white contrast roof which looks good. The chunky thick C pillar adds to the solidity of the XUV300. The cabin of the Mahindra XUV300 is a nice place to be in. The upholstery is done in white leatheric material and the dashboard gets black treatment. The fit and finish inside is good with minimum buttons and a clean uncluttered look. Mahindra has done well to give a long list of features inside the XUV300. Starting off with this dual tone treatment inside the cabin, you have the new 7 inch touchscreen infotainment system which offers you loads of information. You have inbuilt navigation, you go to the home button, you have the EcoSense uh, score. So right now my score is 64 and I think you can go till 100 so I have a lot of work to do on my driving. Right. So you also you go to the program button. You go, to, uh, you go to the settings and you go to the car info. So you have display for uh, tire pressure, you have the fuel information, you have a reverse camera settings as well and of course you have service information about service intervals and so on and so forth. Now the really interesting thing here is this button. So what it does it, it offers three driving modes only for the steering. So the engine performance doesn't get altered. The three driving modes for the steering are Eco, Comfort and Sport. So when you're driving normally in city, you can choose the Comfort option which lightens up the steering. It's easier when you're parking and it lightens up the steering. When you go inside the Sport mode, it firms up the steering, adds more weight 
and offers you a sportier, you know, sexier driving experience. Also, this is the first time, the first in segment uh, feature, which is the dual zone climate control. And it comes with memory function. So you have three settings that the dual zone AC can uh, memorize. And you just have to press this button and you know, select whatever setting you are comfortable with. Apart from that, you have two USB ports, one aux port, a 12 volt socket, and there are multiple, you know, cubby holes, storage system, which makes your life a lot easier. So overall, as far as features are concerned, I think Mahindra has nailed it. The touchscreen infotainment system offers smartphone connectivity in form of Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The other interesting feature is the multicolor instrument cluster, which can be programmed to have different colors for night and day. And of course, in case you want to feel the sky and the sun on your face, Mahindra is offering a sunroof as well. Do keep in mind that most of these features will be offered on the top spec W8 variant, which is the one we drove. Mahindra will also offer 7 airbags on the top spec variant of the XUV. Apart from that, dual airbags along with anti-lock brakes are standard on all variants along with ISOVEX as the child seat anchorage. You also get parking sensors up front and at the rear along with the parking camera. The car has hill start as well. So Mahindra will be offering a 1.2 litre petrol and a 1.5 litre diesel engine for the XUV300. We are driving the diesel variant today and we are really impressed with how smooth the engine is and also the NVH levels are quite sorted. The cabin insulation is really nice. Coming to the performance, the 1.5 litre diesel engine makes about 300 Newton meters of peak torque between 1500 to 2500 RPM. And Mahindra says that this is best in class. So right from the word go, there's this nice, lovely swell of torque, which comes in really handy when you're pottering about town. And also it makes for quick overtakes when you're driving on the highway. And as far as ride quality is concerned, it's quite supple. The suspension soaks up all the undulations on the road quite nicely. The 6-speed gearbox 2 works very well offering smooth and precise shifts. The torque does taper off towards the top end but that is not where the engine revs will be. It will be in the middle and the torque curve is pretty flat in the bottom and the mid-range, offering great drivability. High speed stability could have been better but nothing that causes you to worry. The XUV300 has a ground clearance of 180mm which is more than enough for the car to sail over all bumps and potholes that you could find in the city, but is still less than that of its rivals such as the Vitara Brezza, Nexon and the EcoSport, all of which have a ground clearance of 198mm and more. We truly believe Mahindra has come up with a quality product with a long list of features, some of them segment first, the XUV300 has the ammunition to take on its rivals such as the Maruti Suzuki Vitara Brezza, Ford EcoSport and the Tata Nexon. What stands out are the quality and the overall package. Should Mahindra nail the pricing, it might just disrupt the segment which in itself will be a big achievement. Time for us to slip into a short break but when we come back it is the face off of the year. You don't want to miss it. Welcome back. This is CNB and we have quite the shootout lined up for you now. It's the all new Wagonar. You saw the uh, big review, of course, on the show last week. And of course, now it becomes that tantalizing rivalry once again after so many years. Wagonar versus Santro. 
Yes, the Hyundai Santro returned just a few weeks ago, isn't it? It wasn't so long back. We were talking about that being the latest new car on the market and now it's the Wagon R. So the two of them, well, they simply had to be put to the test to figure out which one is the real tall boy. Maruti Suzuki Wagon R has just been launched in an all-new Avatar. The third-generation car now uses the hardtech platform just like the Swift, which makes it bigger, more dynamic and safer too. Moving the Wagon R into the modern era and yet allowing it to retain its brand strengths was Maruti's primary motive to design an India-specific bigger Wagon R. But that was also almost exactly what a certain other player had in mind too, isn't it? Now, when the Wagon R nameplate first arrived in India, this is way back in December 1999. At that particular point, this was the car that Maruti was sort of taking a bit of a gamble with. It was the tall boy. It was coming at a time when another car had become the benchmark for tall boys. I am, of course, talking about the first generation of the Hyundai Santro. Now, isn't it interesting that the third generation of this car comes to us at a time when we have a brand new Santro also in the market. And so, of course, we have to pit them against each other. Sure, there was a time when the Santro really took on the Zen because the Wagon R in its first generation was not initially a massive success. But the two tall boys quickly squared up as adversaries soon after. And isn't it interesting how today's new age Santro is a not so tall boy? Both iconic nameplates and yet from the very first cars we got to now, they both moved on big time. Yes, these are much more modern, better built, better equipped cars that drive a lot better too. But styling wise, I have to say both of them, well, they're sort of backward looking in a way. And with the Wagon R, it's intentional. It's trying to look like a Wagon R with the Santro. You have to ask the question why. After Hyundai's recent design successes, the Santro's looks have been underwhelming. The Wagon R, on the other hand, builds on the car's boxy square appeal and takes it into a modern interpretation for the first time. The muscle is not forced, with the lines all working. The same is true for the face and tail. On the Santro, the lines and the metal appear forced and the lights are, well, boring. So let me talk about the Wagon R first. Now, like I said, it's trying to be the tall boy. It wants to maintain, like you look at it and you know it's a Wagon R. I have to say it's a good interpretation of that. I know many of you on social media have been giving me this feedback saying it looks like a box. Well, you know what? In a way, it's supposed to and yet it has those modern elements. I like what's been done in the face. A little bit of a detail on the headlamp and then of course all the sculpting in the metal along the side. The rear of the car also is certainly just much nicer looking. It's wider. It still has that nice tall vertical stack on the tail light. It all works. On the Centro, yes, there are a few bits that are nice and modern. You do have the cascade grille in the front and uh, well, very European looks. But given what Hyundai has been doing off late, I know I've already said this, so I won't take too much time saying it again. I just expected this car to be drop dead gorgeous, which it wasn't. Now, you again do have a lot of sculpting in the metal on this too, but it's a bit questionable as to why it's really there. I know it's not been appreciated too much, but in terms of proportion, here's the interesting thing. That car certainly looks nice and tall, but the Santro, when you put them next to each other, really looks nice and wide. Hyundai's played it smart with the Santro by bringing in a powerful petrol engine. It gets a 1.1 liter petrol motor, which is good enough for 68 brake horsepower and the torque figure stands at 99 Nm. There's also CNG on offer and that sees power drop slightly at 59 bhp but still good enough for a car this size. Maruti is big on options though. There are two petrol engines on offer, the 1 litre and a more powerful 1.2. 
There is no CNG yet, but Maruti promises there's one in the pipeline. The 1 litre produces 67 bhp and the 1.2 has a much higher 82 bhp. The larger engine has more power and is the familiar K12 series from some of the other Marutis we know, but it's been tuned more for efficiency. With the two petrol engines, Maruti certainly gives customers quite a choice as per their preference. Now there's more choice in transmission options too as both engines get the 5-speed manual and a 5-speed AMT. The Santro also gets the option of a 5-speed manual or AMT but the CNG does not have the AMT. In terms of fuel efficiency, the Wagonar has the upper hand as both the engines are more fuel efficient than the one in the Santro. 21.5 km per litre and 22.5 compared to 20.3 on the Santro. On to the drive next. Now we want to really test the cars with their combined USPs at the four, and which is why both our rivals here sport AMT gearboxes. So while the Wagonar is in its highest trim, the ZXI, the Santro has the sports. That's one below the highest, which is as high as you can go with the AMT. So then, first up, the newer car. The stance of the car is impressive, the seating position, the nice view of the road. This is something that a lot of people are going to appreciate about the Wagonar. First, it will impress you with the way you can get in and get out easily and then it's the fact that on the road too, you get a good sense of control. Now, having said that, of course, you have to also acknowledge the fact that uh, all Maruti cars of late have just been leaps ahead of some of their previous generation versions. By that, of course, I am hinting at not just performance, you know, it's not just the engine performance or the gearbox or the AMTs, but more importantly, it's got to do with uh, just the overall build quality. I mean, these cars, they certainly handle a lot better because they are built a lot stiffer now. That said, the steering still lacks feel, as I've said in my review, and the new 1.2-litre K12 engine has limited punch. Now, the Centro. Now, straight away, it's a huge difference. The character of both the cars is immensely different from each other, while on the Wagonar, you have a sense of that slight, exaggerated, almost commanding height. Here you don't get that, but you get a sense of the width and so it's a lot more comfortable to drive. It has a bigger car feel for sure and you know, the right quality really on this car I think is something that Hyundai has cracked and uh, it feels therefore very comfortable. Also very nice, the AMT. The performance of that cannot be dismissed because uh, of course you know it's an AMT at the back of your mind but it is the smoothest AMT on the block, certainly boards well. When you think about Hyundai's upcoming products like the QXI or Styx, its subcompact SUV. So while the Wagonar scored on looks, the Santro takes it on performance. On the inside, the cabins are similar in color palette and equipment. Both cars have multifunctional touch screens, but the Santro has power window controls up front placed under the gear shift. And that's a bit weird. Its screen is good, but the Wagonar debuts Maruti Suzuki's brand new Smart Play Studio interface that's more advanced. You can marry in three devices at a time, use its own navigation, and also still get the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto like functions. Plus, the freshness of the cabin is more evident, even though Hyundai is better on plastic quality on the Santro. The sense of space the Wagonar has and conveys is also miles ahead of the Santro. The latter's seat at the back is wider, but the headroom and legroom on the Wagonar is undeniably bigger. Both cars get decent safety equipment, but the Wagonar has dual airbags as optional on every variant, while driver side is standard. Rear parking sensors and central locking are standard across the range. The top trim ZXI option is also available on the AMT, like I said, on the Santro, that's limited to the Magna and Sports variants. Now, this is a sore thumb for the Santro, for sure, on both counts, where you can only get the dual airbags and parking sensors on the top Astar trim, and that's a manual. Driver airbags and ABS are, of course, standard across variants. And that is why the prices are not an accurate reflection of what you really get for that money. 
The Wagonar's lowest spec is the 1 litre and it starts at 4 lakh 19,000 rupees for the LXI. That goes all the way up to 4 lakh 69,000 rupees and the AMT with the 1 litre costs 5 lakh 16,000 rupees. The more powerful version starts at 4 lakh 89,000 rupees and goes all the way up to 5 lakh 69,000 rupees. The Santro holds an advantage here because it undercuts the Wagonar by a little more than 30,000 rupees on the base variant. With five variants on offer, prices for the Santro start at 3 lakh 89,000 rupees, going all the way up to 5 lakh 64,000 rupees. The AMT variants of the Santro are priced between 5 lakh 18,000 and 5 lakh 46,000 rupees. So remember, there's no top trim AMT. So it's interesting how the two cars match up. I mean, on some things, you've got the Centro that goes ahead. On some, it's the Wagonar. And let's just get down to brass tacks. Now, when it comes to ride quality and the quality of the AMT per se, yes, it's the Centro. There is absolutely no dispute on that. It's also very good value, especially for some of the starting prices. But let's be pragmatic. Who really buys the base version anymore? Not too many people. And which is why it's not as if the Wagonar has much higher prices, frankly, on value. I think the two cars are reasonably evenly matched. And so, with its better looks, better appointed cabin, better features, and certainly much nicer standard safety equipment, the Wagonar takes this one. And isn't it surprising? Because in the past, when these two cars were head-to-head -head several years ago, it was always the Santro. But now, Maruti has got it right. So the classic rivalry is back. The Centro versus the Wagon R. Please react to that story. React also to the XUV300 because looks like Mahindra is setting the cat amongst the pigeons there. Pricing will be key and pricing will be out on the launch. That's next week. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Staggering new study from Nissan that proves what we already knew. 90% of the people sitting in the back in India don't wear their seatbelt, don't even think about it. Please, let's change that statistic. So think about it now. Please wear your seatbelt front or back, it could save your life. On that note, I'm going to say goodbye. See you next week.